No one would have believed that at the turn of the 21st century, the city-state of Singapore was being secretly watched by a fanatical terror organization with links to Al-Qaeda. Few people would have considered the possibility of an attack happening on Singaporean soil. If the attacks had been successful, there would have been hundreds and hundreds of casualties. But slowly, toward the end of 2001, plans were culminating with potentially devastating consequences. Singapore, home to one of Southeast Asia's most economically stable and multicultural societies. Over four and a half million people populate this city-state, covering a landmass slightly smaller than that of New York City. A combination of strong governance and miraculously economic growth over the last 40 years has given rise to a secure and stable way of life that some say is now taken for granted by many of its citizens. But in 1997, chilling plans were being put together to undermine that peace and security and to ultimately change the Singaporean way of life forever. station and this is a one of one of the buses uh, one of the regular buses that uh, ferry the military personnel from Sembarang to Yishun MRT station rush hour in the northern suburbs a young Singaporean man stands opposite the entrance to Yishun MRT train station and records on video the scene in front of him and this is the bicycle day as you from the footpath that leads towards the MRT station. You will notice that some of the boxes that are placed on the motorcycles, these are the same type of boxes which we intend to use. Assuming the guise of a tourist filming a holiday video around Singapore, the man is describing his intention for a sinister plan. He aims to detonate a bomb to cause as many human casualties as possible. At the time of the recording, the local authorities know nothing of his presence. There's the entrance of the temple with many vehicles parked there. You'll we'll notice there's a drainage hole. Drainage hole. It might be useful. Having gathered his necessary reconnaissance material, unbeknown to the man making his getaway, his videotape would later be found in one of the most dangerous places in the world. Nearby, in the northern suburbs, a condominium manager finishes work. His name is Ibrahim Maiden. Maiden is a self-taught religious scholar. Despite no formal training in religion, he conducts Islamic classes to young Muslim men in small private groups on a regular basis. But these classes disguise a secret agenda. At first, Maiden talks broadly about Islam and advises on ways to become a better Muslim. But after a while, he directs his lectures toward more specific topics. Typically what would happen would be he would conduct these small religious classes within these houses. Um, after each class and during the class, he would bring up instances of how 
how the Muslims around the world have been disenfranchised. Um, he would bring up examples of things like Bosnia, Chechenia, um, several other countries. Thereafter, after class, there would be a couple of students who would always be a little bit more keen to know a bit more about uh, what he meant. They would stay back, ask him a couple of questions. After several weeks of repeated classes, Maiden has created a close group of trusted individuals. Now he preaches his very personal views on how various governments and individuals oppose Islam around the world. And then most crucially, the need to rise up and fight back to change the system. They had what we call an in-group speak. So they would talk about it, they would understand that it would be their religious duty. Um, there is a level of secrecy that surrounds the entire conversation with the understanding that um, this needs to be done, it is urgent and there is a need for them to come together collectively to change the system. But unbeknown to Maiden's impressionable students, the man standing in front of them is the Singapore operational leader of the fanatical organization called Jamai Islamia, known as J.I. Maiden is a charismatic man whose motives are entrenched by the work of Islamic rebels who fought in Afghanistan in the 1970s. He was so impressed with the Mujahideen who had then liberated Afghanistan. He even entertained the idea of getting Singaporean Muslims to go and live in Afghanistan, which he considered a truly Islamic state. Maiden's students are being assessed to see whether they will join J.I. and for some, go on to make what he claims as the ultimate sacrifice in the name of their religion. Namely, a fearless campaign of violence to eventually overthrow Singapore and turn it into an Islamic state. J.I. calls that campaign an armed jihad. The J.I. members were promised martyrdom if they died in the cause of jihad. As twilight descends across Singapore and people head home after work, behind the closed doors of another suburban address, the Singapore J.I. cell is busy playing host to another secret meeting. A Singaporean J.I. cell member by the name of Kaleem Jafar is present. Jafar works as a printer, but he secretly harbors a specialist's knowledge in explosives and bomb making. The J.I. in Singapore depends uh, very much on video reconnaissance of their targets. And this is usually done over several visits. At the conclusion of their visit, what they would do is to uh, compile the videos together into a composite video, which would then be used for their final preparations and planning. J.I. is planning to target American and Singaporean civilians who use the shuttle bus, which ferries passengers from Ishun MRT to the U.S. Navy base at Simbawang, some three kilometers away. At the time, neither the authorities nor any known member of the public have any idea of a terrorist organization presence in Singapore. J.I. is operating covertly and completely undetected. Before the attacks can be carried out, J.I. needs the blessings of their most senior authority. In mid-1999, Jafar sets off from Singapore, bound for Afghanistan. His mission is to present the plan to attack the shuttle bus at Ishun MRT train station to senior members of Al-Qaeda for their approval. As Singapore prepares to sleep, several members of a fanatical organization called Jamai Islamia, known as J.I., are hard at work in the northern suburbs. After devising a deadly plan of attack on the Ishun MRT train station, one of the cell members called Kaleem Jafar leaves Singapore to seek approval from Al-Qaeda.
JISL member Kaleem Jafar arrives from Singapore to brief Mohammed Atef on his plan. Atef is number three in command with Al-Qaeda and a close aide to Osama bin Laden. He briefed them in English because they could not speak Malay and Kalim's Arabic was limited. After watching the video, Al-Qaeda leader Mohammed Atef gave the go-ahead for the plan to be carried out. Analysts say that when J.I. plans to attack targets in the name of their religion, they would call such an act an armed jihad. However, among the Islamic faith, the real definition of jihad is rooted in a complex and delicate history. The classical understanding uh, of jihad uh, is a uh, struggle. It's not armed struggle per se, but it's struggle. Uh, in fact, many classical sources refer to jihad as a struggle against oneself to overcome one's uh, baser instincts. So it's a struggle to be a better person. But J.I. promulgates jihad as an act of violence. Violence as a means to achieve their ultimate goal of not only overthrowing Singapore and turning it into an Islamic state, but to do the same across multiple countries in Southeast Asia. One by one, these countries would eventually be liberated to achieve a super state known as the Islamic Caliphate. J.I. has always believed in the Al-Qaeda uh, worldview that the only way to achieve the goal of uh, creating a pan Southeast Asian Islamic State uh, is to use force, essentially because the governments in Southeast Asia are either secular or uh, believe in uh, governing philosophies that are, in the J.I. view, uh, anathema to, to the Islamic conception of the world. But in the case of the proposed attack at Ishun MRT train station in Singapore, J.I. is not targeting political icons, but instead, ordinary civilians. Civilians are seen as guilty because of the, the, they pay taxes and they give political support to governments that then go ahead and oppress uh, Muslims in different parts of the world like uh, uh, Palestine or Afghanistan or uh, you know, even Chechnya or Bosnia. So to that uh, extent, civilians uh, in the J.I. and Al-Qaeda conception of the world are not innocent. One chilling example where civilians are regarded with little innocence happens in October 2002 on the Indonesian island of Bali when two massive explosive devices go off, killing over 200 people. Former J.I. terrorist Idris played a key logistics role in the bombing of a third target, a U.S. consulate building in Bali, acting as a link between the planners and the field operatives. Following his eight-year jail sentence, this is the first time Idris has appeared in a television interview. He recalls being indoctrinated to the J.I. movement and learning of J.I.'s interpretation of jihad. Isi dari penghantar itu yang penghantar kita ke dalam itu hanya dikenalkan bagaimana perjuangan, seputar perjuangan. Yang dimaksud dengan yang saya terangkan tadi, yang dimaksud dengan perjuangan itu ya bentuknya jihad. Pemahaman yang mengarah kepada jihad ya. Ya dari awalnya memang yang namanya jihad, intinya kita peperangan, berperang ya. And that war, according to J.I. indoctrination, is an order sent from the highest authority. Perintah jihad itu kan dari Allah, bukan dari manusia. Karena kita beribadah kepada Allah, apa yang diperintahkan kita lakukan. Berarti itu pesan Allah, perintah Allah. Outside Ishun MRT train station in Singapore, the so-called armed jihad being planned against commuters using the shuttle bus is within weeks of execution. But then, for some reason, the plan is aborted. Although the Al-Qaeda leaders appeared interested, the plan was subsequently abandoned for unknown reasons.
Some analysts speculate that potentially one of the reasons why the attack was shelved uh, may have been the lack of funding, uh, but that is speculation at best. While the speculation remains, Singapore unknowingly receives a narrow escape from its first terrorist attack, at least for now. Two years later, on September 11, 2001, the world at large is introduced to a fanatical organization called Al-Qaeda, striking at the financial heart of the United States. While the U.S. reels from shock, in Singapore, Jamai Islamiyah is conducting a new plan of attack. Subsequent investigations would reveal this is a plan of attack on a whole new scale that will dwarf the aborted attack on the Isshun MRT train station two years earlier. But this time, the attacks for Singapore are being masterminded by one of the FBI's most wanted men. He is one of J.I.'s most senior strategists, has close ties to Al-Qaeda, and his name is Hambali. Before defecting from J.I., former commander Nasir Abbas had an associate relationship with Hambali. What I heard before in Singapore that Hambali directly gave an order uh, to to join members in Singapore and then uh, the people who have been ordered by Hambali directly uh, do the, the, I mean, the operation. Maiden is now working under the direct leadership of Hambali. Hambali, dubbed the Osama bin Laden of Southeast Asia, communicates with the Singapore J.I. cell. Their biggest concern is how to acquire over 17 tons of explosives under the guise of fertilizer called ammonium nitrate, known as AN. The plan was for J.I. to rig six trucks, each with three tons of AN, and then to attack six Singapore targets simultaneously. The six multiple targets are the U.S., Australia, Israeli, and British embassies, plus U.S. naval bases. The plan is hugely ambitious. The outcome is potentially catastrophic. Uh, ultimately, Singapore was targeted because essentially of its close uh, strategic relationship with, with the United States and with Israel. And uh, essentially, Singapore has always been seen by both Al-Qaeda and J.I. as part of this uh, Western coalition that is arrayed against uh, the Al-Qaeda and J.I. Uh, coalition. One month later, J.I.'s chilling plan for attack steps up a pace when a plane lands at Singapore's Changi Airport. On board are two men. Their names are Algozi and Jabara. Both have substantial experience in bomb making for Al-Qaeda. And Hambali has requested their expertise for the proposed attacks in Singapore. It was Al-Qaeda that sent separate operatives into Singapore in uh, October 2001 to do a final reconnaissance of the targets for attack. This time, J.I., allegedly working directly with Al-Qaeda, has the funding and top operational expertise. And now, they are deeply encouraged by witnessing the success of Al-Qaeda in New York City just one month earlier. When they heard there's an operation in New York in 9-11, it gave more spirit for them. Yeah, it gave, it gave more, I mean, uh, something proudly, yeah, that their friend, their brothers, yeah, uh, had success, did an operation in the America, so why not them? September 11th would definitely be a strong motivational factor. I mean, it put in perspective um, the potential of what an attack could do and how it could govern the world stage and how it could govern the eyes of the masses. By October 2001, Singapore is just eight weeks away from facing a downtown terrorist attack 
that would not only kill and maim hundreds of civilians, but push Singapore one step closer toward J.I.'s vision of an Islamic caliphate. A terror plot is underway to blow up several key targets across Singapore. Masterminding the plot are several fanatical leaders, including Hambali, acting on behalf of Al-Qaeda, and Maidan, the newly promoted spiritual leader for the Singapore branch of fanatical organization Jamai Islamiyah. On October 2001, two men arrive in Singapore called Al Ghazi and Jabara. They have been requested by Hambali to procure explosives and to orchestrate the attacks on the ground. That had uh, a pool from Al Qaeda Central, if you like, and this this is why we had uh, uh, the uh, uh, Muhammad Mansur Jabara the Al-Qaeda link and uh, Fatur Rahman al Ghazi, the bomb maker, uh, coming to Singapore in October to sort of uh, work with the J.I. Singapore cell to case out uh, the, these particular targets. The plan is to rig six truck bombs, each loaded with three tons of the explosive ammonium nitrate, and detonate them simultaneously at various downtown targets including the American, Australian, British, and Israeli embassies. The consequences would be devastating. The series of terror attacks seen in Jakarta and Bali in Indonesia between 2000 and 2009 mirrored the signature of the proposed attacks for Singapore. Namely, multiple explosions to be set off simultaneously, leaving a wake of panic and uncertainty. Could something like this really happen in Singapore? Ambali continues to lead top-level meetings in order to finalize the attack protocol being drawn up by Al Ghazi and Jabara. Sketched plans are thrashed out on paper to determine the best sequence of events that would be crucial to the success of the attacks. Jabara assigns one JI cell member to procure 17 tons of the explosive TNT needed to rig the six truck bombs. But Jabara is advised that procuring that amount of TNT will raise suspicion. So instead, they agree to using three tons of ammonium nitrate per truck, which can easily be disguised as a fertilizer. The truck that brought down the World Trade Center in Oklahoma City in 1995, that truck was rigged with between two and three tons of air. give you an idea what damage these bombs would have made in Singapore. By December 2001, the plan is ready and the final attack protocol is revealed to the group. Subsequent investigations would reveal that Jabara instructs the local Singapore J.I. cell to leave the country the day before the attacks. Hours later, Six unnamed suicide bombers will arrive in Singapore from the Middle East. They will be briefed and then instructed to drive the truck bombs to their assigned targets. At between 8 and 10 a.m., they will detonate the bombs. Instantly killing themselves and hundreds, maybe thousands of innocent civilians. Jabara specifically says that the attacks must be simultaneous, going off during the height of rush hour to maximize casualties. We could only speculate that if the attacks had been successful, there would have been hundreds and hundreds of casualties 
in what is essentially a prime area of Singapore, the not just the economic and social dislocation would have been very significant. There would have been a political impact as well because Singapore has always been seen as a very hard target and uh, it has a certain iconic status within Southeast Asia. The idea of an attack um, would have severely damaged the psyche and the social fabric of Singapore. Um, it's not something that the public would have expected or anticipated at best. So in terms of just its effect on the social fabric, uh, it would have been very devastating. By the end of December 2001, in the eyes of J.I. and Al-Qaeda, Singapore should have met its fate. Hundreds, maybe thousands of civilians would have perished. Widespread panic and uncertainty would take a grip, and tensions between Muslims and non-Muslims would ensue. Singapore would never be the same again, and J.I. would move one step closer to creating the Islamic Caliphate. At least, that was the plan. During the final planning stages of the proposed attack, an unknown Singaporean contacts the Internal Security Department. He is about to provide information that will potentially change the course of history. Three months after Al-Qaeda rocks the U.S. on September 11th, senior members of fanatical organization Jamai Islamiyah, known as J.I., are in the final stages of planning a terror plot to strike the financial hub of Southeast Asia. Their plan is to simultaneously detonate six truck bombs in a carefully orchestrated attack on Singapore. Working with Al-Qaeda, it is predicted that the death toll would be hundreds or maybe thousands of innocent civilians. Similar planned terrorist attacks are seen in the Indonesian capital of Jakarta and also in Bali during 2002 and 2003. They go to illustrate the scale of panic and destruction likely to be seen in Singapore. But three months earlier, something happens that would ultimately bring the terror plot to a grinding halt. In September 2001, as the world goes on high alert following the attacks in the U.S., an unknown Singaporean contacts the Internal Security Department, known as the ISD. The first specific lead that ISD received uh, about the existence of the Jemaah Islamia in Singapore came from a Singaporean. Following the September 11, 2001 attacks in the US, this Singaporean provided information that a Singaporean named Aslam, who is of Pakistani extraction, this Aslam claimed that he knows Osama bin Laden. He also claimed that he had fought alongside the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Exactly how this chilling information is received by the ISD and how much more is said remains unknown. But speculatively, the revealed presence of Mohammed Aslam causes an immediate reaction by the authorities. And shortly afterward, the ISD mounts covert surveillance on Aslam. The ISD then began watching Aslam and his associates on 4th October 2001, Aslam suddenly left on a flight for Pakistan. It was later learned that actually he was bound for Afghanistan. In the days that follow, the ISD began to track some of Aslam's associates. As they do, a frightening picture begins to emerge of a highly developed and well-organized terror network operating within Singapore. But then, four days later, Aslam disappears. Possibly unbeknown to the authorities, 
he leaves Singapore and flies to Afghanistan. Uh, when GI member realized Singapore government uh, searching and looking for the GI members, yeah, and then some of them who uh, feel in danger, yeah, run away. Was this an escape? Did Aslam know he was being monitored? Meanwhile. One of Aslam's close associates is also under surveillance by the ISD and is observed trying to procure a large quantity of ammonium nitrate under the guise of fertilizer. It becomes apparent that J.I. has sinister intentions, but like any investigation, the need for evidence is crucial. The question is when to strike and blow the final whistle before it's too late. Just a few days later, that question is answered when the U.S.-led coalition forces invade Afghanistan in October 2001. Mohammed Aslam, the first J.I. member to have fled Singapore, is arrested in the Afghan capital, Kabul, by allies of the U.S., the Northern Alliance. Aslam is then extradited to Singapore to face the authorities. We can only speculate, I guess, in terms of what they would have been thinking at this juncture. But I think that there, there is indication that they were trying to, you know, hold on together and say, you know, we need to be resilient in the face of these arrests because, in their opinion, in, in, in their ideology, they believed that this was the way that they needed to go in order to achieve the end game, the end state of the Caliphate. Now, with their first suspect in custody, on December 8, 2001, the ISD officially begin their operations against the Singapore cell of Chamai Islamia. One of the key questions authorities want to know is the scale of their presence in Singapore and whether J.I. is working in cooperation with Al-Qaeda. Starting the very next day, a total of 23 Singapore J.I. cell members are captured over the course of three weeks and brought in for questioning. This is a huge blow to J.I. strategist Hambali, who has fled and gone into hiding in Thailand. Of course, Hambali feel bad feeling, yeah, and he himself also in hiding in Thailand, yeah. Uh, so that's why he just only can have a far distance communication to his men in Singapore. But his communications with Singapore J.I. spiritual leader, Ibrahim Maiden, come to an abrupt end. When Maiden, too, is arrested and detained by the Internal Security Department. After days and weeks of questioning, the authorities are still unable to verify whether J.I. has been planning their attacks with the support of Al-Qaeda. What is apparent is Maiden's calming sense of J.I.'s destiny, even in the light of his own arrest. He told a senior ISD officer that he had made a mistake of moving too fast. He said he should have waited for Malaysia, Indonesia and Mindanao to become Islamic State before moving against U.S. targets. He said that this would be inevitable and one day Singapore will also be absorbed into an Islamic State. Maidin said that the fact that the plan was eventually not carried out was because God did not will it to happen. And then, on December 14, 2001, a surprising piece of evidence linking the Singapore J.I. cell with Al-Qaeda finally comes to light. Following a U.S.-led military strike in Afghanistan, troops come across a collection of videotapes amongst the rubble of a house, once belonging to a senior Al-Qaeda commander. They discover 
that these tapes contain surveillance recordings of the Ishun MRT train station carried out in Singapore three years earlier. The discovery of a JI-made video of the MRT station in the home of Mohammad Atef in Afghanistan, who is a close aide of Osama bin Laden, underscores the close link between JI Singapore and Al Qaeda. By December 28, 2001, the ISD has made multiple arrests across the island. And this signifies the beginning of the end for J.I. in Singapore. News of the J.I. arrests and of the videotapes found in Afghanistan make headline news. And then, in January 2002, J.I. explosives expert Roman Algozi is arrested in Manila, Philippines. He was arrested in Quiapo, Manila last January. After fleeing from the waves of arrests being made in Singapore one month earlier, Roman Algozi's arrest is considered a major victory by the authorities. Had Roham not been arrested in January 2002, the plan would have been carried out with disastrous results. Singapore wakes up to the reality of a virulent and cold-blooded terror campaign being plotted right in their own backyard. The question is, is it truly over? In the aftermath of it, there was a letter written by someone who was going to be arrested later on in 2002 September, Muhammad Jauhari. Uh, what he then wrote was a letter saying to the wives of those who had been arrested, don't worry, be fervent, um, maintain your resilience and stay firm because at the end of the day we are chosen. In their opinion, they were sanctioned by God. My brothers and sisters, please understand that the recent incident is but a test from Allah. Probably it has, more or less, challenged our patience, faith, confidence and principles in upholding Allah's religion. Hence, as your fellow brother, I urge you to patiently persevere, strengthen your faith and devotion to Allah, and to hold on steadfastly to the responsibilities entrusted upon us. It doesn't mean that they stop, I mean, their, their, their intention, I mean, they are opposed to intention. They still have an intention if they have a chance. With the detention of Singapore J.I.'s spiritual leader, Ibrahim Maiden, the organization's capabilities are severely damaged. But one of the key masterminds behind the attacks, Ambali, remains at large. By December 2001, Jamai Islamiyah's disturbing plans to blow up key targets across Singapore come to a grinding halt. Earlier that year, an unknown Singaporean provides information to the Internal Security Department that blows the cover of J.I.'s presence on the island. And when surveillance tapes of Singapore are found in the home of an aide to Osama bin Laden, J.I.'s suspected links with Al-Qaeda chillingly become apparent. Although the imminent attack on Singapore fails, subsequent investigations made by the Internal Security Department, known as the ISD, reveal an already well-developed network of J.I. cells across Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. And now, evident in Singapore, the country is to be ultimately transformed into the Islamic Caliphate. But analysts speculate that even if J.I. were to achieve their goal, there was never a plan for how the caliphate would actually operate. There is no blueprint as to how this caliphate would then um, unfold. Who's going to be this emir? Who's going to take over? Who's going to lead? Um, none of those questions ever answered. For Idris, 
former J.I. operative who played a key logistics role in one of the Bali bombings. The idea of achieving the Southeast Asian Islamic Caliphate is a decision he feels is perhaps best left to a more divine authority. Yeah, kita, while Idris was never destined to take part in any of the proposed attacks for Singapore, his involvement in the attacks on Bali represent what some analysts say was a second attempt by J.I. after the plot for Singapore was foiled. J.I. had wanted to target the Western diplomatic commercial interest Singapore that failed, then within J.I led by Hambali, there were further discussions as to what to do next. So that's how I can draw a direct line from the failed Singapore plot to Bali 202, October 202. By the end of 2001, the Singapore JI cell had pushed Singaporeans dangerously close to joining the recent Al-Qaeda hit list of cities. But while the planned attacks were thwarted silently, and behind closed doors by the authorities. It is a chilling reminder of the level of sophistication such religious fanatics are prepared to go to to further their cause. Now, the question is, how much of a threat remains? And where is it likely to come from next? Because the Al-Qaeda Central or Al-Qaeda core group uh, was disrupted as a result of Operation Enduring Freedom uh, launched by the US after 9-1-1 in Afghanistan. Uh, the internet became a particularly important uh, medium for these uh, uh, militants and the leadership of Al-Qaeda to communicate with one another and to spread their ideology so as to recruit new members. Over the last few years, Al-Qaeda-affiliated terror groups use the internet to post extremist propaganda materials online using chat rooms and dedicated websites. They use the internet to both preach to and recruit new sympathizers. In the case of J.I., some of their former militants may have regrouped and are suspected of appearing in this clip posted on YouTube in early 2010. Islam akan tegak dengan jihad inilah Islam akan mulia. Karena tanpa jihad Islam akan hina. Tanpa jihad Islam tidak akan tumbuh di manapun. Tapi manakala kita bisa menegakkan bendera jihad, insya Allah syariat akan tegak dan kemuliaan akan kita dapatkan rahmatan bagi seluruh alam. Analysts say the threat to Singapore and the local region is likely to be re-emerging once again as many of the next generation of potential militants become radicalized over the internet. In 2007, in the western suburbs of Singapore, a young married Singaporean lawyer logs onto the internet and begins to view content uploaded by radical extremists. For that individual, for him, he was looking at extremist materials on the internet. Uh, he made contact thereafter with a terrorist organization in Pakistan. Right. Um, and in the process, what he also wanted to do was to go to the Middle East so that he could uh, learn Arabic a little better, so he could speak to his brethren there, as he would have put it. Sometime later that year, the authorities learn of this man's activities, and following extensive monitoring, he is arrested while attempting to leave Singapore for the Middle East. What this man's ultimate intentions were remain unclear. not just the threat from organized institutional groups like J.I., which are significant, but also the more diffuse threat of self-radicalized individuals who for some reason find what uh, radical extremists say on uh, the internet, on YouTube, appealing. So the challenge facing law enforcement, not just law enforcement, but the wider community is uh, getting pretty complex. The U.S. Embassy in Singapore was one of J.I.'s primary targets. 
We take all threats seriously. JI continues to operate in the region in 2010, as do other groups, as well as self-radicalized individuals, any of whom, if given the opportunity, would like to carry out acts of terror. So we remain vigilant in trying to prevent any acts of terror against the United States, whether in Singapore or throughout the world. Radicalization is a complex alchemy of ideology and psychology. In the case of the foiled attacks against Singapore, such an alchemy proves it can lead to deadly consequences. Radicalization is a phenomenon that afflicts uh, all religious faiths. Uh, it's not, uh, not just an Islamic problem. It is uh, a state of mind that is the, the problem. Former JI commander Nasir Abbas fled from Jamai Islamiyah in 2003 and now assists the authorities with tracking down wanted JI militants. Although he assisted in the training of the Bali bombers, he says that when they claimed their bombings were an act of jihad, he realized this was a grave misinterpretation. They think that what they did is jihad, they think in the right path to do an obligation, yeah. Uh, in the name of Islam by do revenge but the only place to do a jihad is just only in the battlefield as for former JI terrorist Idris following eight years of imprisonment for his involvement in the Bali bombings he remains as yet unsure about whether he would return to acts of armed jihad Batasan waktu saya, kondisi saya, apalagi fisik yang sudah tidak normal. Kondisi seperti saya harus mengenal orang saudara yang sakit, orang tua yang sakit. Fisik saya secara normal sudah tidak normal, sakit juga. Itu menyebabkan ya terasa satu ya sebentar ini harus cooling down ya, boleh Despite shared intelligence across Southeast Asia and with scores of arrests made, terrorists in the region continue to keep authorities on high alert. Whether Singapore will become subject to another terrorist threat is something no one can predict. Because the country has never really been uh, subject to a successful major terrorist attack, like I say Bali or September 11, there is this sense that uh, you know the, the government has always been successful in protecting Singaporeans. But looking back at the 1980s, what the Irish Republican Army told the British government, you have to be lucky all the time, but we have to be lucky just once. <laughs> 